Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And to me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for Christmas Eve 2022, which falls on December 24, 2022, as it usually <laughs> does, are from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7, Psalm 96, Titus 2, 11 to 14, and Luke 2, 1 through 14, bracketed uh, possible verses 15 through 20, but you might as well just add those in uh, and take in the whole, take in the whole story. So tell it all. Yeah. Merry Christmas Eve to our listeners and to you too, Joy and Matt. And happy birthday to you, Caroline. Thank you very much. Yes, it's uh, it's a bittersweet birthday this year. My parents were now are both gone with my dad passing back in September and people frequently would, well, still frequently ask me or make a comment about what a horrible birthday to have. <laughs> oh, I feel so sorry for you that Christmas Eve is your birthday. And and my parents always made it so special uh, that it was, I never felt like I was getting, you know, the short end of the stick or whatever. I always felt like it was the most wonderful day to be born and to celebrate and, we would we tried to separate it out uh, by going to breakfast or having breakfast mm -hmm. since I was born in the morning because we always celebrated Christmas on Christmas Eve. We oh. that was our that was our tradition. Christmas Day was kind of a eat eat had dinner, but everything was everything happened on Christmas Eve. So mm -hmm. so it's a bittersweet uh, Christmas or birthday for me this year, but I will. Uh, I will rely on and and take solace and joy uh, and comfort in in all of the wonderful memories, which is in part what Christmas is, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. The opportunity to rehearse the joy. Yeah, and that's really what this text does, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we both of our commentar commentaries, both for tonight and for for Christmas Eve and for Christmas Day, start their commentaries by saying, okay, what else do we say <laughs> that hasn't been said about this passage? But that's part of it. We hear this passage every single year uh, because it is it, it, it is that familiar text that, that does bring comfort and joy and reminds us of, of, of the story, obviously, but that, that comfort of the familiarity uh, mm -hmm. and and maybe that's you know maybe that's part of uh, part of hearing this story this year is just is that comfort and familiarity and perspective mm -hmm. that uh, the need for comfort or how joy is experienced um, uh, individually for you but for all of us for a variety of reasons the last couple of years makes this give us different perspective. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think very much the rehearsal uh, may very well this year be a reminder that we need to tell the story in its fullness uh, to remember how it has sustained generations um, in the midst of uh, some very difficult times when um, we need to hear, don't be afraid. <laughs> um, and when we need to know that the promise that has been made uh, is actually coming uh, in our zip code. Mm. Where are you landing this year, Matt? Where am I landing? Um, well, I'm festive. Feeling you, very festive. I, 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 yeah, I... I haven't transitioned even from fall yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, purple. Yeah, so yeah, you know, I'm wearing the plaid vest today for very festive. Who, this is this is to help the the YouTube viewership, so that the people <laughs> who are only listening audio feel like they're they're missing out. Uh, plaid vest on. Um, yeah, I got a whole spread of of uh, charcuterie and brandy here in front of me. Uh, if you can't see on the screen, it's. Um, 
you know, it's not a, it's not a usually a big night for preaching on Christmas Eve. There's so much else going on and so many other things that do the preaching besides the sermon, but I hope people take time to, uh, to expand on this and to preach the word of God. This year I'm struck in the Luke text that after, you know, four weeks of Advent with not just the texts and the preaching about anticipation and about mystery and about really huge expectations and all of the energy that goes into Advent preparations. When you hit this night, what's not part of the text is certitude or understanding, mm -hmm. but you get things like terror, you get praise, uh, you get interest, you know, the response of the shepherds who are, keen to follow uh, and do what the angels tell them to do. And, but nobody has this epiphany moment where it all makes sense to them, where they, they tie all of the loose ends together. What has been advertised as kind of an ending or the culmination of Advent, at least in our, in our liturgy comes across now as a new beginning. And that's, I think a place to point people, which could be obviously isn't disappointing, but how that, how that builds hope and how you talk about where Advent got us. And the Luke text, of course, is so full of emotion and so full of dislocation geographically, physically, politically, but also I think intellectually and spiritually of just no one's quite sure what's going on. You need, you, you need Simeon to come in uh, later on in chapter two to start to point us in some directions. And then of course, John and so on and so forth. But, yeah. So I would, I think some of that is, is occasioned this year um, and not to try to resolve the terror, not to try to resolve the fear and try to resolve the confusion and certainly don't dissolve the wonder mm -hmm. and the joy and the praise. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. I, I've been talking about a, a particular verb here for a little while now and that verb in verse 19 that Mary treasured all these words but then pondering them in her heart and we I think we have this image of Mary pondering as a as a sort of uh, contemplative reflective kind of uh, passive sort of um, act and yet the verb here I always like to point out and remind people of because it's certainly where I'm sitting this year. The verb here is sumbalo. Mm -hmm. And balo is throw and sum is with or together. And so it, it can be translated, uh, you know, it can be translated to meet or to consider or to compare, pondering, but it literally has this sense of things being thrown together mm -hmm. uh, that really don't make sense that they are thrown together, <laughs> that they're put together. And, and so that pondering is, is, uh, is really not even making sense, but just acknowledging that these, these things that shouldn't be, that, that shouldn't be, in the same room or shouldn't be a part of the same night or shouldn't be all these people together, shouldn't be all together. It's all happening. And like you said, Matt, it's not about understanding it or making sense of it, but that observation. And I, maybe that's something that a preacher could invite people into is what is your, what, what are you pondering this Christmas? What is, what are some things that are being, uh, thrown together, uh, for you that you, you know, you just, you had an anticipated or are somewhat of surprise or amazed or that caused some of the feelings that we experience in the text. Uh, that would be maybe one homiletical direction. Yeah. And the, the um, and part of this too, is the whole notion of, I don't know, the, the idea of a God who comes near, which, or even uh, the idea of a Messiah come near. I mean, how, what people think is going on is not totally clear at right? all the, all the characters. And Mary, of course, probably knows more than anybody else, given what the, what Luke has already told us, but how some of that is also probably terrifying at one level. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of, a, of, of God being born or of God's emissary being born, uh, whatever people know about 
singing about Mary here, you know, about other Old Testament texts. Uh, and then even more broadly, when you think about Luke's audience and people in the Greco-Roman world, people who are first reading this, the idea of a deity coming to visit uh, is more terrifying than comforting at its at, at the surface, right? At the at, at the first hearing of that, it's only because we've been so acculturated into Jesus as meek and mild that we think this is good news or pleasant or a silent night. Um, and so just to think about that as well, just how astonishing mm -hmm. the how astonishing is the way in which certain boundaries have been crossed here in ways in which, you know, the God that you fear <laughs> or the God that you hope for is going to help determine how you imagine what this scene feels like. And then how do you make yourself open to being surprised by where the story might lead? Yeah. It's a lot to pack into one Christmas Eve sermon, mm -hmm. I realize, but it's how you tug on some of those emotions, you know, and, and, and let the rest of the service help do that lifting for you. Mm -hmm. And for all that um, is familiar, uh, as you know, we opened up talking about, uh, I have to confess, I um, got myself watching The Chosen and uh, that uh, video series that uh, is telling the story of Jesus. And uh, I, if I remember the details right, it started with this little clip that is a story about the, the shepherds. Uh, and um, if you haven't seen it and you want um, a visual to cause you to look at this very familiar scene and capture more of the surprise of it, um, I, I invite uh, our, our listeners to, to grab that if they can. Uh, it's um, it, it takes all of the license that we take when we do our um, our little Christmas dramas and we conflate all of the the gospel uh, stories together. Uh, I think Matt, you said we have to do that, or maybe it was you, Caroline, because somebody's been waiting for their time to to be king. But uh, but uh, it 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 also um, provides that unexpected, uh, that this isn't the story we think we know. Um, what's happening here then um, was long promised, and yet they were almost clueless when it, when it finally comes. And uh, as we shift from the season of Advent, which so often becomes just preparation for Christmas, um, maybe holding on to Advent as also the anticipation of the return of Christ. Um, we've heard that, but we're really clueless as to what it really means. And maybe for those of us who believe we've got our ticket, you know, and, you know, our, our, our card is punched, maybe it will be just as disruptive for us as it was for the first century uh, followers of the uh, promises of ancient Israel, because they thought they knew what the Messiah would be. They thought they knew what the, how the promise would be uh, fulfilled. And it was nothing like they anticipated. And yet it was absolutely incredible, so incredible that here we are 2,000 years ago trying to set up that same promise of comfort and joy. Can we talk a bit about Isaiah as well? Please, please. Are we ready for that? So. Yeah. I think I mentioned this last year. This, this passage is read every Christmas Eve at my church, and it's always read really well and early in the service. And part of what I love about that is because it describes such a bleak existence <laughs> of, of warfare and of being under siege and of having your resources and your hopes extracted. I mean, it's, it very much sets, well, I like it in my service is it sets Christmas in the perspective of people who have been victimized, which in my church is not many of us, to be honest. And so you look around and you see a lot of people all you know, dressed nicely, their plaid vests and things like that. And it's, it's this reminder of how foreign the story is. And now I know Isaiah has got its own history and the commentary is helpful with that. 
but just to talk about how that sets the scene to realize, oh, wait, this isn't maybe my story, at least not immediately so. This is the story of a people who have undergone uh, just this wearing amount <laughs> of, of warfare and of losing and of fear and to see how hope figures in this story. I just like it. It dislocates me from my usual kind of privileged approach to Christmas as, you know, gifts and good food and everybody's happy for a night and things like that. But it's this, so it, it forces me to recognize I'm not on center stage here. I'm looking at the Christmas experience, so to speak, and the messianic hope um, from a distance. And I need to learn what it means to enter into that. I appreciate that, Matt, in especially in being able to set the episode against the ancient realities. Um, we're more familiar with the New Testament telling. Um, and so Isaiah, the Old Testament, the first announcement um, seems like, oh, that makes sense now that I know uh, the, the story from Luke or, or, or the story from, from, from Matthew. But in actuality, this was the promise. This is what was long anticipated. This is what they were waiting for and for so long. And while they were waiting with this great expectation, every single bad thing that could happen was happening. And so they needed this promise, but more than needing the promise, they needed the promise to be real. And, and so I really appreciate uh, this, um, shall I say, invitation for our listeners to to bring this text back in to set up the um, the context, so that the uh, the dislocation or disruption of the incarnation can truly be felt, um, because I think that's where we're living today. We are living where all of the promises of what the Christian story has been seems like um, seems like empty words. And um, maybe we need to know faith in the word of God that is a promise from a faithful promise maker. Mm -hmm. And if we can rekindle that, that might get us through whatever the horror of 2022 Christmas might be for those who are listening to us preach. Yeah, and I think I I really like those themes that we're that we're bringing up and <clears throat> that that into into that unrest and and or or into that those realities. Uh, verse, how do, what does verse six then sound like? Uh, that for but a child has been born for us, a son given to us, and in the midst of all of that. Uh, the, all of those realities, yet it comes down to a child and then the names for that child. And so how do, what does wonderful counselor mean now? What does mighty God mean now? What does everlasting father, prince of peace mean now? And invite people maybe to uh, ponder, uh -huh, ponder that and, and not necessarily define it, but I, uh, how, what do those words sound like? Uh, what, what are those descriptions, those titles of Jesus sound like here and now? And will they make a difference beyond uh, beyond tonight? Is it, are, they, are they claims about Jesus that you can hold on to uh, going forward? Um, Christological claims, you know, about Jesus that you can maybe, yeah, maybe hold on to in the next weeks or months. And because we tell this story because we know the promise has been made real in Jesus, and because we tell this story because we have this faith, I'm just going to sing a song out of season because 
when I read the psalm, I just wanted to say, I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing and obey the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, as we are bringing forth those words to do so in such a way that whether we're living in expectation or we're rehearsing the promise we hold confidence in, that it is heard in such a way that it's we want to run and tell. We want to run and, and find this baby. We want to see for ourselves. And, and that's what I will sing these praises made me think of. Uh, and and I think also maybe um, uh, just putting the words of Titus in that kind of context. I don't know, Matt, what do you think about that? Oh, with Titus? Um, that was, I, sorry, I thought you were going a different direction. But... Ah! <laughs> I'm curious as to what you want to do with Titus. So. <laughs> well, Titus still points us forward. So earlier, Joy, you talked about that the Christmas is not a forgetting about the hope of Jesus return, you know, Advent kind of has all of this stuff. And then sometimes that disappears at Christmas and you go, Oh, that's right. It's about Jesus. And the Titus text reminds us that it's, there are these two different manifestations, these two different appearances, these two different epiphanies that Titus is talking about one, when the grace of God appeared, I believe there is talking about the letter there is talking about Jesus. And so that's interesting too. What is, what does it look like when grace appears? That's an interesting Mm. question for a preacher but then also this idea of how we are being how we are waiting for the manifestation of his glory again manifestation in other words so which raises the question the pastoral question the theological question is how does christmas train us toward the expectation of jesus return yes advent one was all you know stay awake stay awake look out look out look out uh anytime now you know it's, it's a different kind of mood how does christmas which often in terms of our liturgy, in terms of our aesthetic is about time travel back to the first century and, and kind of watching what's happening in the streets of Bethlehem, which is nice and great. I'm not going to mock that for being overly sentimental, although sometimes it is. But Titus is also interested in how does this now prepare for a particular kind of life in expectation of and our own participation in this revealing of divine glory in all of its fullness. I don't know the answer to my own question, to be honest. I don't have a good answer to my question, but it's that's what the text raises for me. But I love the question. Yeah, and I, I think, too, the Titus text, I mean, you, you mentioned this uh, in passing, Matt, but just to come back to, for the grace of God has appeared, and that 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 you know the um, it's the epiphany it's an it, that's the verb right has or it could be has has shined right and uh and so that it it locates god's grace as not a concept or uh something that you have or that you receive but that makes itself known uh in the world and you can see it and experience it and uh, and so maybe a preacher, you know, we we talk about grace, we like grace, we want to think about grace, but it's almost impossible to to it's almost impossible to define. And yet, Jesus is grace, and so this grace appeared. And and so what? How is how is Christmas Eve an appearance of grace? And what does? What does grace then mean, uh, the grace of God mean on this very holy night?